In 1908, one of the most controversial marathons ever took place. The race was the highlight of the fourth of the modern Olympic Games, which had been marred by disputes and diplomatic incidents. But these rows and rivalries attracted international interest in the competition. We had to fight for our rights, rights which any real sport-loving country would have insisted on seeing given to a visiting athletic team. It was the beginning of the celebrity athlete. The only thing that could have beaten me was a bullet in the back. I will win or I will die. Out of 56 runners, only 27 made it to the finishing line. He was in a state of absolute collapse, almost without a pulse. And the controversy over the final winner would be argued about for decades. What I did then, I would do again under similar circumstances. It even affected the royal family. The king would not give the prizes as had been planned. Although the 1908 Olympics divided nations, it also made headlines across the world. It was this interest which propelled the Olympic Games from being a mere sideshow to the major event that it is today. In April 1906, the eruption of Mount Vesuvius devastated Naples. The news quickly reached every corner of Italy and became the hot topic of conversation. But despite the human tragedy for the Italian government, the disaster came at a very opportune moment. It was Italy's turn to stage the modern Olympics, but such had been the shambles of previous games that they were reluctant to do so. With the vast cost of rebuilding Naples, Italy now had the perfect excuse to withdraw as host. The idea for the revival of the Greek Olympic Games had been a burning ambition in the heart of educationalist Baron Pierre de Coubertin for many years. He dreamt about reforming the education system through sport. For de Coubertin, reintroducing the heroism, courage and ideals of the ancient Greeks would counter moral and physical decadence. Using his own words taken from diaries and speeches, we can reconstruct his thoughts, ideas and aspirations for the games. I shall strengthen a Flabian cramped youth, its body and its character, by sport, its risks, and even its excesses. I shall enlarge its vision and its hearing by showing it with wide horizons, heavenly, planetary, historical, horizons of universal history, which in engendering mutual respect will bring about a ferment of international peace. All this is to be for everyone, with no discrimination on account of birth, caste, wealth or occupation. Pierre de Coubertin was a romantic and idealist and he wanted to revive the Olympic Games. He had a great idea that if you brought the young people of the world together in friendly competition on the sports field and the running track and on the river, then they would get to know each other and they could subliminate all of their rivalries into sport rather than war. He was a great Anglophile. He spent a lot of time in Britain. He was a great admirer of British public schools. And I think a great deal of his philosophy, it was educational philosophy really, was modelled on the idea that the English could churn out people who were healthy in both mind and body. To find evidence that sport could reform the moral as well as the physical development of young people, de Coubertin travelled to England. What had been a mere germ of an idea suddenly took root. As early as the 15th century, many rural sporting events held in England described themselves as Olympic. The most important of these events were the Much Wenlock Olympian Games, inaugurated in 1850 by sports enthusiast Dr. William Penny Brooks. They're still celebrated annually every July in Shropshire.
De Coubertin went to visit Penny Brooks in about, I think, 1890, about six years before the Games started, and he more or less went away with a blueprint for the Olympic Games and actually said if anybody should be credited with these Games, it's Penny Brooks, Englishman. I wanted to export rowers, runners and fencers. This, I believe, is the free trade of the future. I wanted the restoration of the Olympic Games. Dr. Brooks also had this sense of internationalism. De Coubertin observed how the Games at Much Windlock combined the elements of a medieval country fair with contemporary sports discipline. For instance, hopping races, cricket, football and tilting at the ring were practiced in medieval costume. By the 19th century, private schools such as Eton and Harrow had incorporated sport into their education curriculum. Romanticized in Tom Brown's school days, it was precisely this British sporting tradition that de Coubertin sought to emulate. He planned to use the Olympic Games to develop children's enthusiasm for ancient Greece. It is not easy, if indeed easiness is a good thing, to get children enthusiastic about Alexander or Caesar. They need something more alive, more real. Olympic dust is what excites their emulation best. Finally, at the 1894 Parisian International Athletics Congress, de Coubertin presented his ideas for the revival of the Olympic Games. The meeting proved to be a huge success. It was agreed that the ancient Olympic Games would be revived. The International Olympic Committee was formed and an Olympic charter produced. Why have I restored the Olympic Games? In order to ennoble and strengthen sports, to exalt the individual athlete, whose very existence is necessary for the involvement of the community in athletic sports, and whose achievements provide an example to be emulated. Good. But not everyone applauded de Coubertin's success. Stick for the end. America's most important sportsman, James E. Sullivan, was furious. He'd not been chosen to form part of de Coubertin's International Olympic Committee. But nevertheless, as Secretary General of the American Athletic Union, he would become a major influence in Olympic decision making. Sullivan was a journalist of Irish descent and a key figure in democratizing sport in the United States. So Sullivan wrote about track and field, about baseball, about other sports, and had a, quite a fine athletic career himself. He's also instrumental in the founding of the Public School Athletics League, the first uh, sporting league in public schools in the United States and New York City as well. Go the blue and make another turn. Sullivan's aggressive and outspoken attitude contrasted sharply with de Coubertin's aristocratic manner. I wasn't into Cooperton's magic inner circle, so I wanted to form our own American International Olympic Committee. In spite of all these troubles, by 1896, de Coubertin witnessed his dream come true. The King and Queen of Greece opened the first Olympic Games for over a thousand years in Athens. They were a local success. They were, the standards weren't very high, but the Greeks took to it with, with great passion and great interest. So after a, after a brave introduction to a, a Olympic Games revival, then 1900 the Games were staged, were due to be staged in Paris. Baron de Coubertin had put an awful lot of energy in it, but he made a huge mistake there. He allowed the Olympic Games to be held in conjunction with the Paris International Exposition. And it was a complete and utter shambles. There was no organisation, they went on for months. People ran in them, they didn't know that they were called the Olympic Games, they had no idea. There was no real team selection. In 1904, the Olympic Games were supposed to be held in Chicago, and then President Roosevelt got involved, and eventually it, it was decided that the Games would be held in conjunction with the St. Louis World Fair. Again, they repeated the same mistake, and the 1904 Games were an absolute shambles. 